now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. We've now had uh, three reports on the government's failure in long-term care. Of course, the first was the Canadian Armed Forces report last year. Uh, last week, we had the Auditor General's report. Uh, and of course, on Friday of last week, we received the uh, Long-Term Care Commission's report, a report that was really devastating, Speaker, uh, quite horrifying uh, and painful to read uh, in terms of some of the the things that people shared with the Commission about what was happening in long-term care. Uh, but the failure of the government was clear. Uh, the report says, and I quote, alarm bells should have been ringing loudly in Ontario. There was no plan to protect residents in long-term care. Speaker, it was the minister's job to protect seniors in long-term care. She failed. Will she do the right thing and resign? Respond, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And you know, I I want to first of all commend um, the Commission for their important and insightful work, uh, as well as the work done by the Auditor General to to really um, uh, go back and understand what brought us to uh, the pandemic today and what we can do moving forward with the guidance. And they were very clear, both the Auditor General and the uh, Commission report, about the many years of neglect uh, of this sector leading up to the sorry state. Uh, that our government found um, the long-term care sector in. And we were working very hard from the very beginning to make sure that the staffing crises that pre, uh, predated the pandemic um, was, was addressed, the capacity issues, the 38,000 people on a wait list, all of these things uh, needed to be addressed. And, and that's quite frankly why I came Bonds. to politics, is to, is to fix a system so badly neglected uh, by previous governments. And our government is doing the work. Thank you. Well, Speaker, there's no denying that cuts and neglect by the Harris government, the McGuinty, Wynn, Del Duca governments, nobody's denying that that was the case. There's no argument there. But the, the report clearly shows that this Ford government was making cuts that cost lives. They literally got rid of the comprehensive inspections back in 2018. In 2019, they were cutting long-term care and public health. It was this minister's responsibility to protect our seniors in long-term care. She failed at that job. Will she now step down from her job? Thank you, Speaker. As I said, the Commission has provided very important insight into the many years of neglect. Uh, as a family doctor, this is devastating to me to be able to, uh, you know, to want to be able to help to have measures taken that simply did not accomplish the necessary um, prevention that was required. And the Commission talks about measures, additional measures that we can take to address, to address this. This is foundational. This was also a collaborative approach. Many, many groups involved, Public Health Ontario, uh, Ontario Health, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, our, our local health integration networks, and the list goes on and on. Thousands of people have been working round the clock to address the, the crises related to the, the the COVID-19 pandemic, and this is happening around the world. Our government is the first government in the history of this province to make the investments necessary to Spons. overcome the, the previous years of neglect. We will continue to do this. We will move forward with long-term care. We will continue to do the work until this sector is shored up the way it should have been done years ago. Well, Speaker, the minister doesn't want to uh, take responsibility for what the commission describes as this government's failure, and so I'm going to remind her uh, of something that they said, that there were no excuses for the deaths that occurred in the second wave. And I quote, the summer of 2020 was the time to prepare for the second wave, with the lessons learned from the first wave and a summer to fortify long-term care. It was reasonable to anticipate that the second wave would be less punishing than the first. That was not 
the case. The Commission showed there was no staffing plan put in place by this government. There was no infection prevention and control plan, no funding for extra resources in that regard. Homes were left to self-assess their ability to deal with COVID-19. That was this minister's job. It was her job to protect seniors in long-term care. She failed. Question. Will she do the right thing and resign now? Minister of long-term care. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Despite those uh, remarks by the member opposite, uh, they are simply unfounded. Our government has continued, and uh, it's absolutely Order. unfounded what you have just said. Our government has continued to work with our sector. Uh, the survey was one of many, many measures taken. Uh, we learned lessons in the first wave, an unknown virus not known to the world, global shortages of, of uh, many, many things, and, and working around the clock to address uh, the problems in this sector. Your, your remark, the remarks by the member opposite are absolutely unfounded. The Commission points over and over and over again to the long-standing systemic issues. We worked to, to shore up the staffing in the sector, hiring 8,600 and more staff into, uh, into the sector with our pandemic Response. pay, uh, and the survey informed the fall preparedness plan. Each of our long-term care homes was receiving uh, the support uh, that our government collectively was, was uh, organizing. And so, you know, when she talks about uh, the things that she— Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. My next question is also for the Minister of Long-Term Care. I did, however, send her over the direct quote from the Commission that outlines the issues I just raised in my last question. But this question is about the ongoing failure of this minister and this government in long-term care. It's very, very clear that staffing remains a huge problem in this sector. Uh, we know that the staffing levels are, in fact, lower than they were in the first wave of COVID-19, but still this government is not supporting uh, the, the working folks that work in, in, in the uh, sector. and in in fact, uh, what the government has done uh, is basically call into a, a question their ability to get this sector dealt with. They have not yet put in place what the Commission says they should do immediately, increasing the wages of, of staff permanently, making sure those jobs are full-time jobs, permanent jobs, uh, making sure that people have uh, the staffing necessary in long-term care to receive four hours of hands-on care Question. now, not in 2025. Nobody believes that this minister will make those changes, that she'll bring those changes to Ontario. Will she resign now? Thank you, uh, Speaker. Those remarks are stunningly ignorant, and uh, I say that. Speaker. I'm going to caution the minister on her language and ask her to conclude her response. Thank you. And so the issue really is, if you want to have adequate staffing in long-term care, you want to uh, have the, the necessary support for residents, you need to actually train the staff. And that's exactly what we're doing. That's a, you, to, to, to get to... To get to four hours of care, you need people who want to work in long-term care, who are trained to work in long-term care, and that's exactly what we've done. We hired over 8,600 into long-term care uh, uh, at the end of the first wave, into the second wave. Those measures were taken. We have 8,200 in the pipeline, 6,000 new and 2,200 already. We have another 8,000 coming through the uh, district school Response. board and private career colleges. We're using the, the, college, uh, the public college system to train. We will have uh, 10 thousand within a year. That is far more than any previous government ever order. did. We are fixing this problem. The Leader of the Opposition will come to order, and the Leader of the Opposition can ask her supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, the Commission was also clear. Uh, about the profit motive in long-term care, and I'm going to quote again from the Commission's report. Uh, it's difficult to see how one can build a culture of excellence in care when care is only a means to profit. Now is the time to re revisit the business of long-term care. You know, the, go the Ford government should have been cracking down on long-term care. They should have been pulling licenses, Speaker. They should have been uh, taking over those for-profit homes, but they didn't do any of that. Instead, what they did was stop the inspections and then remove any uh, legal liability from the private for-profit long-term care sector. 
Speaker, they did exactly the opposite of what they should have been doing. How can this minister, who has relentlessly uh, stood up for and, uh, and approved of the for-profit model in long-term care, have the trust of the people of Ontario that they will do the right thing and get rid of the profit motive? Nobody believes they will. Will resign. This is Thank you, Speaker. And, and I think the magnitude of this problem has been building for many, many years. That's clear from the Auditor General. It's clear from the Commission's uh, report. And uh, we are taking action on this. The, the Commission is very, very clear uh, that it's about being mission driven, that it doesn't matter whether it's for profit or not for profit or municipal. It's about the mission. If you read, Position if you bother to, to read the report, it is about being mission driven. And our government is the on a mission to, to repair long-term care that has been so badly neglected over many, many years, as demonstrated in the Auditor General's report, in the Commission for Long-Term Care report. It is very, very clear, and it is our government that is looking at new ways Response. of understanding how we can separate the operations from the construction. It is this Conservative government that is repairing and rebuilding long-term care, despite the narrative being pushed down. The House will come to order. Leader of the Opposition, final supplementary. Speaker, some of the stories in that Commission report by family members and by staff were nothing short of horrifying. Uh, and I do want to thank those folks who re-traumatized themselves uh, by sharing their stories. And here's one, and I quote, Of all the pictures I have of my mother over the years, the, ones that, the one that's burned into my mind forever is her lying there in a wet diaper, without even a blanket to cover her, with her arm up, stretched in the air, begging for water, and asking God why he had forsaken her. Speaker, this can never happen again. It was that minister's job to protect seniors in long-term care, and she utterly failed. Will she do the right thing now and resign, step down from that post? She certainly has not done her job. long-term care to respond. Thank you, Speaker. As I've said many times, I take responsibility. I took responsibility for this before I even got to politics, understanding and researching long-term care for almost 14 years to understand Order. what we can do. Uh, you, you... Okay. I've repeatedly asked for order. I will have no choice but to move to warnings if members continue to ignore my requests for order. And that will apply to all members. Minister of Long-Term Care, please conclude your response. The key component to addressing this problem, as we are doing, is the action of taking responsibility. That's exactly what we're doing. And you know, I went through this with my own family members. Uh, it is devastating. Uh, certainly, uh, another level being with the pandemic. And I, I, I can only try to understand what families, residents, and staff have gone through. But I understand the neglect of the long-term care sector and what it has meant for so many people, uh, including my own family. And that's why we Response. are repairing a broken system with unprecedented, historic measures, not only plans for staffing, capacity, IPAC. Thank you. The next question. A member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. The COVID crisis in Brampton continues to spiral out of control. Eight of our neighbourhoods now have positivity rates of over 20 per cent. That's more than the provincial, double the, the provincial average, Speaker. For example, in communities uh, in the postal code L6Y at Jacuzzi and Steeles, we see a shocking positivity rate of 24%. In the postal code L6S at Williams Parkway and Bramalee Road, we see positivity rates of 20% and upwards. Speaker, Brampton needs help. We are a city full of essential workers who keep this province moving. But the Conservatives still refuse to step up and help. Our workers don't have enough paid sick days. They don't have access to vaccines and our hospitals are overwhelmed. And experts have been clear. The inequity in this government's response has meant that Peel has not received its fair share and we have been left behind. 
How much longer is the Premier going to let our city burn before she finally gets off the sidelines and does something to help the crisis in our community? Thank you, Speaker. And I would say to the member opposite, through you, Mr. Speaker, that uh, what you're suggesting is simply not the case. We recognize that Peel, Brampton contained with Peel, is a hotspot area as is Toronto and, to some extent, York. However, we made the decision following the recommendations of our medical experts last week because we are receiving considerably larger quantities of the Pfizer vaccine to dedicate 50 per cent of the vaccines coming in over the next two weeks to be dedicated to those hotspot areas. There are 114 across Ontario, but Peel definitely has a number of them. As a matter of fact, we are going to be, during the month of May alone, allocating 432,960 doses to Peel Region, which will make Peel the public health unit with the second highest doses per capita in the province, and that comes simply after Response. Trial. So there is a vast number of a vaccine being delivered to Peel, recognizing it as one of the hotspots, recognizing that Brampton within Peel is a hotspot area. Supplementary question. Speaker, while the Conservatives continue to ignore Brampton, our community is now taking it upon themselves to do the Premier's job. The Safe Peel movement is made up of frontline workers, teachers, community organizations, healthcare workers, and everyone in between all working together to try to convince this government to finally step up and get us the support we need. So my question again, Speaker, through you to the Deputy Premier, is when is this government going to finally step up with the supports we need to save Peel? That means real paid sick days, prioritizing vaccinations to our community, and giving us the supports we need to keep our families and essential workers safe. Thank you. The number of vaccines being allocated to uh, Brampton and Peel Region, as I indicated earlier, the second highest in the province. Uh, we also have over 150 pharmacies in Peel, seven of which are going to be running 24-7. Uh, and six of those 24-7 pharmacies are in Brampton. We also have four hospitals offering. The, uh, uh, the vaccines, hotspot pop-ups administering vaccines. We've had uh, workplace clinics as well at Maple Leaf Foods, Maple Lodge Farms, Amazon, also at the BAPS complex, and 40 primary care sites in Peel Region. So uh, we have the quantities of vaccines coming in, and we also have countless places for people to receive those vaccines. And we encourage everyone over 18 who is now able to receive a vaccine in a hotspot area to please apply and please have your vaccine done as quickly as possible. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Through you, Speaker, my riding of Scarborough Aging Court, like all of Scarborough, has been hard hit by COVID-19. We know that vaccines are the way out of this pandemic, but until now, we haven't had the supply to make a difference in Ontario's hot spots. Can the Minister tell this House what we are doing to target our hot spots communities like Scarborough. Thank you very much. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for Scarborough Agent Court for that very important question. Due to a stable and reliable increase in vaccine supply, this week we are expanding our booking eligibility for COVID-19 vaccination appointments across the province. As of this morning at 8 a.m., individuals who are 18 and over in 2021 and live in one of the hotspot communities will be able to book a COVID-19 vaccine appointment at a mass immunization clinic through the provincial online booking system or directly through public health units that use their own booking system. And I'm very pleased to advise the speaker that as of this morning, as since 8 a.m., over 73,500 appointments have been booked. This is great news for the people of Ontario and great news for the people who are living in the hotspot areas. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your response. It is critical, critical for the people in my riding to get these vaccines into arms as quickly as possible. Can the minister please tell this House what we are doing to support high-risk Ontarians now that we finally have the supply to expand our vaccine prioritization? Minister Health. 
thank you again for the question. Speaker, beginning Monday, th sorry, Thursday, May 6 at 8 a.m., more groups throughout the province will be eligible to book a COVID-19 vaccine appointment through the provincial online booking system and call centre or directly through the public health units that use their own booking system. These groups include individuals turning 50 and over in 2021, individuals with high-risk health conditions, people who cannot work from home who fall under Group 1, including remaining elementary and secondary school workers, and First Nations, Inuit and Métis individuals, in addition to the other channels previously available to book their appointment. We continue to increase the speed and scale of our vaccination program as we receive these significant new supplies from the federal government. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Speaker, experts say this government's 11th hour capitulation on paid sick days was too little too late to have an impact on reducing the spread. In a pandemic that requires 14 days to self-isolate, three paid days won't keep workers home when they are sick. Once the three days are used up, workers who test positive or have to quarantine must go without pay and wait until the following week to apply for the federal program, then wait some more until the benefit arrives. If this government cared about workers, they would have made sure that workers can stay home when they have COVID without risking their own financial security. That means covering 14 paid days of infectious disease emergency leave. Why did the government not do this? Mr. Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, and I, I first want to begin by thanking the member opposite her party, as well as the opposition parties, for supporting our legislation last week to bring in 23 paid sick days for workers uh, in Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm proud to say that we were able to pass that legislation because of the support of all members uh, in this House in, in record time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the health and safety of all workers remains our government uh, our government's top priority. That's why. Uh, the very first action we took as a government was to bring in a job protected leave. If any worker uh, has to stay home because of COVID-19, they can't be fired for that. We also eliminated uh, the need uh, for sick notes. And Mr. Speaker, uh, we introduced last week uh, our uh, paid leave plan to ensure that workers across the province have 23 paid sick days. Supplementary. Speaker, given the frustration that thousands of Ontario small businesses are experiencing with the Small Business Grant Program, there's not a lot of employer confidence that they will be reimbursed quickly by the WSIB for the three paid sick days. For years, WSIB has faced chronic understaffing problems. A massive new workload will be required to administer the new program, which means hiring and training sufficient staff. Speaker, injured workers are already waiting far too long for WSIB claims to be resolved. Will this government commit to providing adequate staffing and training resources for workers at the WSIB to administer the new program so that struggling small businesses aren't stretched even further and injured workers aren't forced to wait even longer? Mr. Labor. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the member uh, opposite and her party, as well as uh, the independents, for supporting our legislation so we could get uh, that piece of legis legislation last week uh, through uh, the legislature uh, quickly. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, one of the reasons why uh, our plan uh, is balanced is uh, the fact that uh, small businesses and employers are going to uh, get reimbursed. And, Mr. Speaker, we've seen a number of uh, private members' bills uh, come forward uh, at Queen's Park over the last couple of weeks that we're going to put 100 per cent of the costs uh, on small businesses, which would have forced uh, thousands of small businesses into bankruptcy and would have ensured that workers would not have had a job uh, to go back to when uh, we get through COVID-19. Uh, our plan ensures that workers get paid quickly and small businesses and employers get reimbursed quickly as well. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. On Friday, the Independent Long-Term Care Commission released their final report. Amongst, it, amongst other things, it highlights a lack of a sense of urgency. It goes on to say the province's response was slow, reactive, critical decisions came too late. Days make a difference, delay is deadly. There are 85 recommendations made by the Commission. There are specific provisions around accountability and enforcement. 
It says repeated findings of non-compliance must be met with consequences of increasing severity, including mandatory management orders and transfer of licenses. So, speakers, through you, will the minister be adopting the recommendations of the commission with regards to accountability and enforcement? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite uh, for that important question. Clearly, the neglect of the long-term care sector had been uh, for many years. The Commission uh, on Long-Term Care is very clear about that. And, and looking at how we can make sure that our staff are supported in long-term care uh, and that resident, then they can in turn support residents in long-term care requires not only transparency, good communication and enforcement, but it also requires the spending um, that is required uh, to shore up the staffing, as our government is doing. Uh, 115 million to create 8,200 um, more, more uh, PSWs for long-term care through the public uh, college system. Another 8,000 uh, through the D district school board and private career college. This is going to amount to 10,000 more staff for long-term care. This is unprecedented in the history of long-term care to address these staffing challenges and, and also you know, the capacity. So absolutely, Response. transparency is key as well as accountability. It must be also through supportive measures that allow the workers to do their jobs. Thank you. Supplementary. I think I heard a yes there. And I do want to remind the minister that we did take way longer to staff up between the first and second wave than other provinces, very clearly, like Quebec. So, but you had the tools before this pandemic. Bill 160, Strengthening Quality and Accountability for Patients Act, passed in December 2017. The bill creates greater standards in long-term care homes and, and uh, enforces greater penalties for home operators who do not adhere to these standards. It outlined new rules on the treatment of residents and raised the bar on accountability and inspections. The bill received royal assent, but you never enacted it. You decided against increased accountability and inspections. You decided against stronger penalties for home operators. You decided against increased care standards and protecting our most vulnerable. So, speaker through you, simple question. Bill 160, it's there, it's question. ready to go. The long-term care provisions, will the minister enact them? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. First of all, I'd like to clarify some of the comments made by the, the member opposite. Uh, our government was able to hire 8,600 and more uh, people into long-term care between the first wave and the second wave through the pandemic pay. Uh, we were shoring up long-term care as we were dealing with not only the pre-existing crises of staffing but the pandemic. And so we understand the importance of transparency. The member opposite likes to use Quebec uh, as an example. They did not hire PSWs. Uh, they, were, they were trained in a matter of weeks. Uh, we were creating a reserve support workforce for seniors. We were creating many supports for our long-term care homes as we went, and, and I think that that's important to clarify. Transparency and accountability are key, and our government will consider the recommendations by the Commission, and we will definitely make sure that uh, we take their, uh, their recommendations to heart. Uh, they are very insightful, and once again, I want to thank the Commission for doing this important work and for being transparent about it and for getting it done on time. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. In my riding and across Order. Scarborough, I hear from many constituents, like childcare workers who cannot work from home. They are an, ex an excuse to get their vaccines so they can continue to provide high quality care to our children. Order. Can the minister please tell this house what we are doing to support the order? <laughs> Government House Leader will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Don Valley West will come to order. The response, Solicitor General. A really important question and, frankly, uh, a, a, a new pathway of this coming week. So thank you for the member from Scarborough Ag Agent Court for raising it. As the Minister of Health said, starting on Thursday, this Thursday, May 6th at 8 a.m., even more Ontarians who cannot work from home will be eligible to book their vaccine appointment. Those include remaining elementary and secondary school workers, including educators, custodial, 
bus drivers, and administrative staff, remaining workers responding to critical events, including police, fire, special constables, children's aid societies, workers, emergency management, critical infrastructure re uh, restoration workers, and remaining individuals working in licensed child care settings, including all licensees, employees, and students on educational placements who interact directly with children in licensed child care centres and in authorized recreation and skill building programs, licensed home care, child care and in-home service providers, employees of home care child agencies, foster care, agenda workers, including customer Response. care providers. You know, Speaker, we've vaccinated five million Ontario adults, and we will continue to do that as our supply increases. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the Minister for that answer. I know many of my constituents are excited to finally be able to book their vaccine appointment. There is a finally light at the end of the tunnel for a Scarborough Aging Court. Mr. Speaker, in addition to childcare workers, there are many more essential workers in Scarborough. Can the Minister tell this House if there are any additional groups that will be able to start booking this Thursday? Thank you. Thank you, General. There, there are, Speaker, and I'm uh, very pleased to share, as I said, five million Ontario adults have already received their first dose, and starting on Thursday, we have an additional group that are uh, eligible to book online. Food manufacturing and distribution workers, agriculture and farm workers, funeral, crematorium and cemetery workers, enforcement, inspection and compliance roles, including bylaw enforcement, building inspectors, food inspectors, animal welfare inspectors, border inspector, inspection officers, labor inspectors, and WSIB field workers. You know, we said from the very beginning when we made our provincial framework that individuals who could not work from home would get access to the vaccine as soon as we had sufficient supply. I am thrilled to be able to share with the House today that that happens Thursday. Thank you. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. I have another question for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, Speaker, I quoted a, a story from a resident. Here's a couple from PSWs in long-term care from the Commission report, and I quote, couldn't get to a resident fast enough that was asking for some water, so here I am, still struggling with the thought of uh, is she thirsty still on her journey because I couldn't get the water to her fast enough. By the time I'm going for the water, someone else is calling or calling out. Another quote, how many PSWs, how many healthcare workers have to give up their lives because we can't get it together? I don't think we have to be. We shouldn't have to die in order to do our job. So there has to be a workable, workable isolation plan. People were crying out for this minister to do her job. It was her job to protect residents in long-term care and protect long-term care from COVID-19. She failed at that job. Will she do Question. the right thing and resign today? Long -term care. Thank, thank you, Speaker. You know, and, and I, it is devastating to listen to the, the stories and to understand what happened. And I think uh, that is the very reason why I'm here in politics today is to address these long-standing issues and why nobody else was doing it before this. I do not know. My resignation would not replace a single war bed. It would not create a single vaccine for someone. It would not stop a single new variant from emerging. But what I can do and what our government has been doing is repairing and rebuilding and advancing long-term care ever since we became government. And we will continue to do that. We are shoring up the staffing, the long-neglected staffing. We are building capacity. We are accelerating uh, builds. We are using new, new methods Response. of construction. We are understanding the needs of families and, and residents, unlike any previous government before us. We are committed to doing this. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, you know, the stories that are outlined, the horrifying, devastating stories in the Commission's report aren't new. The same stories were being told to the government by the Canadian Armed Forces. And as the Commission said, instead of spending the summer shoring up long-term care, 
This minister chose not to do so. This government didn't want to spend the money. Here's another family member's story, and I quote, The bottom line is that dealing with my mom during the pandemic is, is that we saved our mother's life, and she likely would have died from neglect. She lost over 20 pounds in a matter of weeks and was near, nearing death by starvation because we were locked out and unable to help her while staff were off recovering from COVID-19. This minister's job was to protect that woman and everybody else in long-term care from COVID-19. She failed at that job. Will she do the right thing and step down? She does not belong as the Minister of Long-Term Care. She failed utterly, Speaker. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, if you go back and read the testimony with the, the Commission of Long-Term Care, you will see Dr. McGeer talk about the magnitude of the second wave and the, the inadequacies that had been left for many, many years in long-term care. Uh, that The second wave w magnitude was so great, it could not be overcome. And that level of community spread in wave two was very significant. Uh, and so we are here now as a government committed to long-term care, to the rebuilding and the repair and advancing it. And that is very clear from the historic advancements, almost $10 billion to shore up the staffing, our commitment to four hours of direct care per residence, the capacity issues, uh, the dollars that have been spent for the IPAC, and working with all the different entities responsible for the health care system. Ontario Health, Public Health Ontario, our medical officers of health, multiple Response. ministries, making sure that every stone is is turned to repair and rebuild long-term care. That is our mission. That is what we were doing before COVID. That is what we were doing during COVID. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. On Friday, April 23rd, local publication Peterborough This Week reported that on Sunday, April 18th, two OPP officers approached a group of eight parents at a park with 11 of their children. The officers demanding from parents their names and date of birth and then went on to threaten the parents to let them know that in these types of situations, they're liaising with the Children's Aid Society. He didn't explain what the situation was as the parents were not breaking any rules. The Peterborough County OPP's Community Safety and Media Officer defended the move, stating that the OPP may liaise with Children's Aid if social distancing or mask wearing is not done by parents. Does this government believe that it is the job of the OPP to spy on parents in parks with their children, collect their information and go running to children's aid if, in their opinion, the appropriate mask wearing or social distancing is not occurring? To reply on behalf of the government, the Solicitor General. You know, clearly I am not going to be able to um, talk about individual instances that may or may not have occurred. Um, the proper investigation should be left to the um, OPP and or the jurisdiction in which the uh, alleged incident occurred. Uh, what I can tell you is that we all need to understand and appreciate that there is currently a stay-at-home order in place. There are a number of facilities, uh, including a number of municipal um, provincial assets that have been closed to discourage people from gathering together um, so that we continue to stay safe and keep people uh, physically distanced from each other. And if we cannot, then wear masks. All of these pieces uh, together ensure that we can, as Response. much as possible, limit the transmission of the uh, COVID-19 and the variants of concern. And we will continue to do that pr to protect our friends and neighbors. Speaker, it appears that the government has lost the plot. I'd like to remind this government that it is parents, not the OPP, not the minister, and not the premier, but parents that are the primary educators and caregivers of their children. In the same news report, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services said it has not provided specific guidance to Children's Aid to report parents who are not complying with current stay-at-home orders. But that's not good enough. What I want to know is since the news report, has this government instructed Children's Aid and the OPP to back off when it comes to how parents are parenting their children on things like mask wearing and social distancing? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, the, the government has been very clear uh, 
uh, right from uh, the onset uh, that the best way to protect uh, uh, parents and, and, and children is to uh, abide by the, the regulations that have been forward, put forward by our, our uh, medical officer of, uh, of health in the province of Ontario. I think we are both in agreement, both myself, uh, the government and, men, and uh, the member opposite, uh, uh, that uh, parents are, of course, the uh, best place uh, to, to keep their, their, uh, their children safe. Uh, and at the same time, Mr. Speaker, it's the government's responsibility to, to uh, help and provide assistance to ensure that parents know everything and uh, everything that they must know in order to help keep their uh, their children safe. I think we all have the uh, the exact uh, exact same goal, Mr. Speaker, uh, keeping our, our children safe, uh, keeping the province safe, uh, and we'll continue on that path. Thank you. Next question, member for Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, despite an inconsistent vaccine supply to date, our government has continued to build a solid foundation in Ontario's vaccine rollout, with a focus on age and risk, allowing us to reach our most vulnerable populations and have a measurable impact. Can the Minister of Health update this House on the status of our vaccination program for the month of May? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for that question. I was pleased to report, Speaker, to this House last, that last Thursday we were on track to achieve our goal of administering first doses of COVID-19 vaccines to 40 per cent of Ontarians aged 18 or over, which was achieved. As of today, over 5.3 million doses have been administered across the province. Importantly, Mr. Speaker, over 91 per cent of Ontarians aged 80 and over have received at least one dose. Over 25,000 first and second doses have been administered in 31 fly-in First Nations communities in Moosonee, and 95 per cent of long-term care residents are now fully vaccinated, providing a layer of protection to those who need it most. Mr. Speaker, the best vaccine for anyone remains the first vaccine that you're offered and I uh, hope that everyone in Ontario Once. will take that up as soon as they've reached reach the required age and level. Supplementary. Thank you to the Minister for the update. Mr. Speaker, I am proud of what our government has been able to accomplish despite the unpredictable supply of vaccine to date. Now that we have more vaccines being delivered to this month, can the Minister tell us how we are going to expand our capacity to vaccinate even more Ontarians. Thank you. Minister of Health. Yes, and thank you again to the member for the question. Approximately 800,000 doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine are expected to arrive in Ontario each week at the start of May, ramping up to 940,000 doses per week by the end of May. This reliable increase in vaccine supply allows our government to further accelerate our vaccine rollout and get more shots into arms. Because of this, last Friday, we launched a pilot through select pharmacy locations in hotspot communities to administer the Pfizer vaccine to individuals aged 55 and over. Eight stores in Peel and eight in Toronto will participate in this pilot, with each location receiving approximately 150 doses per week to help to continue to provide province-wide capacity to vaccinate as many individuals as quickly as possible. Mr. Speaker, with a strong and steady, steady supply of vaccines on the way, we will continue expanding access to individuals across the province. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, we learned that the Premier's personal pollster and professional lobbyist, Nick Cavallis, has been quietly pocketing over $100,000 a year of taxpayer money to advise the Conservatives. That's on top of this $120 million he's gotten in government contracts from the Premier in the last few years. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Premier. We know it's just not Nick. Corey Tanecki, the chief lobbyist, for big corporations like Amazon is also on the PC party payroll. Why does the government think that lobbyists and PC insiders deserve a bigger say around the cabinet table than the experts like the science table? 
Chairman uh, Clearly, uh, we don't, Mr. Speaker. This is uh, why a cabinet and this caucus have been meeting uh, uh, four months, and this legislature as well has been meeting four months uh, nonstop to uh, bring forward a, an aggressive pandemic response. I remind the member opposite that, uh, indeed, uh, his party uh, voted with the government uh, unanimously. In fact, all members of this legislature voted with the government on a number of proposals uh, at the onset uh, of this pandemic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's the job of the government to bring people together uh, and address issues with respect to a global health and economic pandemic, the likes of which we have not seen uh, in over 100 years, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very proud of the fact that we have done that, whether it's on states of emergency, which we've received unanimous consent for, whether it was on budgets, which we received the unanimous support of this uh, House for, and most recently, the Minister of Labour, who was able to bridge gaps between all parties in this legislature and bring forward a bill on sick pay, which received the unanimous Fonds. consent of every member of this legislature and speedy passage, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're getting the job done for all Ontarians, and, and more, more often than not, we're doing it together, and I appreciate the support of all members. Speaker, again to the Deputy Premier, while lobbyists and PC party insiders are steering the ship around the Cabinet table, Ontarians are asking what the Premier and his ministers are doing. Turns out they're all out fundraising, Speaker. First, the Premier left his 24-hour, super-important cabinet meeting to expand police powers and shut down parks to fundraise his third fundraiser that month. Now, the Minister of Labour has another $1,000 per plate fundraiser planned this week. Speaker, $100,000 per plate pays a lot of sick days. Just saying. So my question again, through you, to the Deputy Premier, why? When we're in the worst crisis our province has ever seen, is this government's top question. priority filling the PC party bank accounts? Uh, of course, Mr. Speaker, we're, uh, we've been working very, very hard. I'll tell you what, uh, what I've been doing. On the weekend, uh, of course, I was able to speak to a, a, a small business in my community that has had a, a challenging time. We opened up uh, just as the pandemic was, uh, was starting. Uh, brand new shoe repair business uh, for, for Stovall, and, and Baktash, is, is, I, I want him to know that we are supporting Order. him and, and helping him. I spoke to two parents, uh, uh, Lisa and, uh, and Margaret, who have, uh, have, uh, have told me about the challenges that they're facing, uh, uh, and, and understandably, the challenges of, 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 of children uh, at home while they're trying to get the, their kids through, uh, through school. Uh, while still doing their, their, their jobs, Mr. Speaker, and I know those are stories that we've Order. heard from a number of uh, people. Uh, the member for uh, uh, North Humberland, Peterborough, was, uh, uh, was telling us uh, with respect Opposition to, come to order. in his riding and the great work that they've been doing on, on vaccinations, Response. Mr. Speaker. We heard from the Minister of Health talk about the incredible work that was done getting all of those First Nations vaccinated in the province of Ontario. There's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. We'll Next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Six months ago, the Premier started talking about vaccines as Ontario's exit strategy out of the pandemic. He did so knowing that distribution would take at least six months to a year, but almost immediately, on cue, shifted the blame onto the federal government. But now we have a major pivot. During his press conference on Friday, the Premier used the phrase vaccine-resistant variants three separate times. So what was the Premier told about vaccine-resistant variants, and what does that mean for us? Does it mean that the vaccine is not a viable exit strategy anymore? And if this government believes that the lockdown is the only way to fight COVID, do vaccine-resistant variants mean that we're going to be in lockdown forever? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And in fact, the uh, vaccinations and the, and the progress that we've been making on vaccinations has, has taken us very far. Over 5 million Ontarians have now received the vaccine. And we also know that even if you have your first dose, you have much greater uh, protection against COVID than if you do not. And even if you do uh, uh, contract COVID after your first vaccination, the evidence has shown that you're not likely 
to require hospitalization and that it will in all likelihood save your life. So we are going to continue. We are receiving more vaccines now from the federal government. It is true that during the month of February, we were receiving fewer doses of the Pfizer vaccine because of some of the work that they were doing on one of their warehouses in Europe. We've also had a slowdown in the Moderna vaccines, but these vaccines are coming in in greater quantities now. We're going to continue to vaccinate people when we're also learning more about the variants of concern. But the evidence so far suggests that except for the South African variant, which is not helpful with respect to uh, using AstraZeneca, we are doing well with vaccines and they will provide people of Ontario with the protection that they need. Supplementary. Speaker, with respect, I did not get an answer to my question. The Premier used the phrase vaccine-resistant variants three times on Friday. The minister didn't use it once. Speaker, the goalpost che keeps changing month to month. It shows that the government never had an exit strategy. That's why Ontarians lost faith in this Premier. It was two weeks to flatten the curve, turn into slow the spread. Slow the spread, turn into stop the spread. Stop the spread, turn into until we all get vaccinated, we must all stay home. And now it's come to this moment. A repeated threat by the Premier of vaccine-resistant variants. Ontarians want to know where this is going because we demand our lives, our livelihoods, and our liberties back. Minister of Health. Well, uh, in answer to the member's question, we have had a plan uh, for um, in protecting the health and well-being of Ontarians since this pandemic began. We ultimately wish to receive the vaccines, which we are receiving now. We are supplying people with the vaccinations, and I'm very pleased that so many people are coming forward voluntarily to receive the vaccines, because that's not happening in every jurisdiction. In Ontario, it is, and we're very grateful for that, for people coming forward to receive their vaccines. However, we also know that we need to prevent the transmission of COVID-19, and that's what we're doing with the stay-at-home order. That is to protect people, again, to keep people from catching either one of the variants of concern or, or the original COVID, if I may call it that. That is also very important, limiting transmission and getting people vaccinated. And we're not going to stop until every single person in Ontario who wishes to receive the Spons. vaccine gets one. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, this question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, speaker, internal emails published by the Toronto Star this morning show how a teacher's Twitter post sent the government spinning into damage control. The tweet shows a crowded 34-desk classroom with barely any room for students to move between desks, let alone stay safely distanced. It's just one of many such examples that have been shared by education workers at a time when this government was repeatedly refusing to cap class sizes. Speaker, is the minister finally ready to admit that holding back needed supports for schools led to the cycle of school closures, the absolutely disgraceful mess that continues to this day? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. What I can confirm to the member opposite is that Ontario has one of the lowest case rates for youth under 20 because our government followed the advice, invested in a plan with the full a uh, st stamp of approval by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. In fact, Speaker, there are, there's a $1.6 billion plan that helped us hire 7,000 net new staff, 3,400 more teachers, 95% of air ventilation systems in the province of Ontario in publicly funded schools, as reported by the boards, have been improved. Mr. Speaker, we doubled the public health nurse allocation supporting our schools. We launched one of Canada's only province-wide asymptomatic testing programs, and we purchased and implemented 33,000 HEPA units to improve air ventilation. All of this because we followed the advice, because we invested, and because our Premier and our government are committed to keeping students safe in this province. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> our schools are closed across this province. We are in the third lockdown. What does this minister not understand about this? All throughout this pandemic, the minister has been more interested in appearances than in actually keeping students and education workers safe. Their approach has failed. 27 per cent of schools had at least one case of COVID before the recent closure. Infections and related isolation requirements caused absolute havoc for families. Looking ahead, school boards have been told to plan for layoffs that their reserves will not be replenished and they still don't have details about this year's funding breakdown. Can the minister tell us how cutting staff 
and inflating class sizes is going to make schools safer or help kids recover from this pandemic? Mr. Speaker, in the words of the Chief Medical Officer of Health last month, our schools I wouldn't dismiss the public Order. health leader of Ontario at a time of a crisis. I would actually have confidence in him at a time when we need our institutions to have that confidence. And his Take your seat. Take your seat. Member for York Centre, come to order. Member for Davenport, come to order. Minister of Education, conclude your answer. It is most concerning to hear that level of distrust in our public health units. But, Speaker, what the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario said is, I quote, our schools have been safe. We want to keep them safe. That's why, Speaker, we put in plan, put in place a plan, a $1.6 billion investment that hired more staff. Our commitment going forward is that we were going to have more staff supporting our schools, continued improvements in air ventilation, the continuation of supports that have been critical, including PPE. And, Speaker, we have, under our government, unlike under the former Liberal government, increased mental health supports by 400 per cent because we know the risks, the challenges are real for our students and for our staff. We will be there for students as we look to September. We've been planning over the past months for that, being ready for wherever this pandemic uh, takes us. We will be ready to ensure schools are safe and they are open in September. Next question, the member for Don Valley West. Mr. Speaker, my question is also for the Minister of Education and actually follows on the, the last question. Mr. Speaker, as of today, none of the school boards in Ontario have received the detailed information regarding the funding for next year, although that information in the form of the Grants for Student Needs was promised a month ago. Speaker, this delay will already have caused turmoil in board planning. How many teachers, how many support staff, how many admin and cleaning personnel? These questions simply cannot be answered until boards receive the GSNs. To compound the problem this year, Boards have not received the guidance that they've asked for on how to plan for the coming school year. What are the public health expectations and what are the scenarios boards should be modelling? These are questions that boards now, already in May, cannot answer. Speaker, students, teachers, support staff in all 72 boards in Ontario have been under enormous stress this year. What will Question. the minister do to ensure that the delay of the GSNs does not have a negative impact on the ability of boards to plan for the next school year? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Indeed, the grant for Sue needs the Priorities Fund and Ontario's Learning Recovery Plan will all be unveiled in very short order to enable our school boards to be ready for whatever scenario, whatever path this pandemic takes as we look forward. While there's a promise of hope with, as the Solicitor General confirmed, educators this week now being eligible, child care educators last week, licensed child care educators being eligible for the vaccine, that gives us hope in a uh, as we look to September, but we have been planning, listening to experts, working closely with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to ensure every public health intervention that has helped keep case rates down, which it is no coincidence, Speaker, that Ontario has one of the lowest case rates of youth under 20 in the country because we put in, plan, uh, put in place a plan that has listened to the signs because we've provided school boards with the funding they needed to combat this pandemic. And so we're going to continue to do that. I assure the member that's coming in short order. Thoughts? Supplementary. It's interesting that the, the minister talks about the funding that was put in place to combat COVID, which was inadequate, but that funding is being removed, Mr. Speaker. In this year's budget, the government claims that it's increasing funding to schools in the province. In fact, while the pandemic is still in full force in Ontario, this government is cutting over a billion and a half dollars from education. That funding paid for boards to support the facilities that, and the realities of COVID, including some, though not enough, extra staffing. Now, with no guidance on how they should plan for next year, the late release of funding information and facing the removal of the support that schools across the province may still need, boards are facing funding cuts. On top of the direct funding cut, boards are also facing the reality that the reserve funds that have been earmarked, that had been earmarked for local school projects that they had to dip, dip into to deal with COVID pressures are not going to be restored. There was nothing in the budget to indicate that Question. the government understands that the use of reserve funds was a short-term, flawed solution to an immediate problem, but that long-term problem still exists. Speaker, when will the government restore the reserve funds to boards so they can fulfil their commitments to local school projects? Minister of Health. Min uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province has confirmed that schools have been safe in this province. The challenge we face in Ontario is a spike in community transmission that has stayed high 
I could challenge within our ICU capacity, and we're all responding and doing our part. What we have done in our school system, Speaker, is, in, is listen to the signs put in place every public health measure possible, quality PP, the cohorting of staff, screening, active screening of children before they enter schools, a asymptomatic testing program that uniquely positioned Ontario to respond both in high-risk regions and in all school boards across the province. We've hired 7,000 net new staff, and I can assure the member and all families in the province, we will be there for school boards in September, for our children, for our staff, and for the families that depend on our publicly funded schools. We will have more teachers. We will have improvements to air ventilation, mental health, Response. in the areas of learning loss focused on math and on literacy, the areas that we know have taken a big, uh, have, we've seen regression globally for students. We're going to continue to invest because we know it matters to families in this province. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, the urban Indigenous community in Toronto has been devastated by COVID-19. According to preliminary data, Indigenous people in Toronto have been hospitalized at more than three times the rate of the general population, and the rate of infection for Indigenous people is 23 per cent higher. But despite that, Indigenous people across Ontario are not receiving equitable access to vaccines. Under current provincial guidelines, Indigenous people living off-reserve are being asked to wait four times longer for their second dose than those who are on reserve. Speaker, this is not the time to be distinguishing between and discriminating against Indigenous people just because they don't live on reserve, when we know that all Indigenous people are equally at risk. Will the Premier commit today to end this racist and discriminatory policy and offer all Indigenous people, on reserve or off, equitable access to their second doses of their vaccines? Minister Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, we are ensuring equitable access to a vaccine to all of the people of Ontario. And I would start with the Indigenous community in the uh, operation, the fly-in communities, with Operation Remote Immunity that was led by Dr. Homer Tien and Orange with people from the community and making sure that all of those residents were vaccinated. Order. However, I can also advise that Chief, uh, Regional Chief Roseanne Archibald is also a member of the uh, task force of the on immunity. And I can advise you, she has been a very opposition come to order of ensuring that Indigenous people living off reserve and living in urban areas also receive their uh, vaccinations in a timely manner, in the same way Response. as the people on reserve have. So, Chief Archibald is a, a large proponent of that within the task force. That concludes the question period for this morning. Being no further business, this house stands in recess until 1 p.m.